The following is a presentation of the Match Talk Podcast Network. Hello, wrestling fans. It's time for the World Wrestling Resource Podcast. The World Wrestling Resource was made that you as a wrestler, parent, coach, or fan can have access to all the resources of the very best in the world of wrestling. I'm three-time wrestling writer and broadcaster of the year, Jason Bryant. And I want you to join me, along with John McGovern and world champions Terry Brands and Dennis Hall, as we talk training tips, topical discussion, mental preparation, and more on the World Wrestling Resource Podcast. World Wrestling Resource is sponsored by Defense Soap. Find World Wrestling Resource on Facebook at facebook.com slash worldwrestlingresource. And follow us on Twitter at WWRESO. And, of course, on the web at worldwrestlingresource.com. Now on to the show as we join John McGovern, Terry Brands, and Dennis Hall. And welcome again, wrestling fans. Episode 60 of the World Wrestling Resource podcast. Find everything you need about various resources that, from the World Wrestling Resource at worldwrestlingresource.com. And you can check out this podcast anytime at wwrpodcast.com. I'd like to thank our show sponsor, Defense Soap. Defend what you have built at defensesoap.com. Today... We're going to learn about a championship lifestyle from Grandview head wrestling coach Nick Mitchell. The Vikings have won seven straight national duels championships. And at the time we record this on February 22nd, 2018, they have won six straight NAIA national championships heading to Des Moines, their hometown, to try to defend said title and win seventh in a row. Uh, Nick Mitchell, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. So uh, in terms of building a championship lifestyle, it's on the shirts. It's basically kind of been a mantra you guys have adopted and then this year, 10th year as a head coach, trying to win a seventh national championship. There's obviously a, a lot of experience that goes into a championship lifestyle. What is it at its core? Oh, uh, man, it's, uh, it, it really is it's the foundation of our program. So um, kind of the uh, long story, not so long as, uh, you know, we, we started talking about it really during the, about the second year of the program. And obviously we, you know, 2008, 2009 was the first year that we had wrestling at Grandview. And so when you talk about um, starting a program from scratch, uh, there's obviously a ton of work that goes into that. But building a culture was the was the part that maybe I underestimated a little bit. You know, we, we brought some good wrestlers in right away, but the culture of the program wasn't where I wanted. You know, and I can tell you all sor- sorts of stories to, to prove that. But um, basically, after the it was right after the second season, I remember being at a tournament and. I actually saw a kid had a shirt on on the back of it said championship lifestyle. So um, it's just to be honest, I stole it, man. I don't, I don't know who, who came up with the term, but I stole it and, uh, and I turned it into something at Grandview and, and I just started kind of talking to our guys about what I thought it meant. And at the time, um, really, I just wanted them to stay out of trouble. I wanted them to be eligible. I wanted to, wanted our grades to get better. Um, you know, I just, I wasn't really thinking of it as, as something that it was going to evolve into being, and the more I talked about it, the more I believed in it. And it really just came down to a simple, simple concept of trying to be the best at every aspect of your life, you know, and obviously we see a lot in wrestling where um, in every sport, it's like this, where um, kids that compete, they love their sport. And so they're really disciplined when it comes to their sport, they work hard in their sport, but in other aspects of their life, they're okay with being average. You know, they, they let themselves off the hook academically. They let themselves off the hook socially in their family life, their faith life. And and they don't think that's going to carry over into their sport. And it's crazy to think like that. You know, if you're, if you work hard in one area and you're lazy in three or four or five other areas of your life, how, how can you say you're a hard worker? You know, the scales are tipped. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. And so that was the thing that we really stressed. And then um, in 2012, uh, we won our first national championship. And that year we finished fourth in the nation in academics. And before that, we had never won a team title and we were never even in the top 20 academically. And so it was a golden opportunity for me to really tell our guys, I told you so, which is awesome. And then, you know, and then the rest is history. The last six years, we've won the national championship. We've never been less than 15th academically. We finished as high as second one year. So that's the game plan for us is we obviously want to keep winning titles, but we want to win that academic award too. And, and it's not, we want to win it because it sounds good. It's because that's, we want these guys to be, we want these guys to live this in, in every part of their lives. In laying the foundation for, for the championship lifestyle, you've been the figurehead, you've been the leader, you've been the coach, but uh, with your own experiences, uh, you did experience a championship lifestyle when you wrestled at Wartburg. You were a, 
remember that 1999 national championship team, even though going back to high school, you were third, fourth, third, and then in college, you were third, second, third. You missed out on the individual championship, but you were part of a team championship. How did that shape you uh, going into your career? First of all, coming out of high school into Wartburg and then into Wartburg, you know, missing, you know, there's so many great wrestlers that have come through that program and, and wrestling for Coach Jim Miller and then missing out on an individual title, but being still part of something special. How much did that really shape uh, how you coach this team? Uh, it shaped me a lot, you know, and I mean, coming from high school into college, you know, obviously not getting what I wanted it was, it was just driving for me, you know, it, it made me better. Um, and then same in college, you know, coming up short, it was tough. And, and it, you know, obviously every wrestler knows, and we can talk about how much it sucks when you come up short and it's, it's crushing and it's something that really doesn't go away. But it, it, it was something to me where um, it's, you know, I talk to our guys a lot about where when you have a setback, you, you can, People always say, like, don't let your, your setbacks define you. Don't let your losses define you. And I kind of disagree with that, really, with me. Like, those, those things do define me because they made me better. And I really feel like almost every good thing I have in my life came as a result of some kind of failure somewhere else. You know, and so luckily for me, I've been pretty good at learning from my mistakes um, where a lot of people aren't, you know. And, and there's some people that they, they're smart enough to learn from other people's mistakes. I wasn't one of those people. I had to make my own mistakes. I had to mess up, and then and then I'd move forward. Um, but at least I learned, you know. Or some some people never learn, and so that was something that it really drove me. And um, you know, as a, as an athlete, and then as a uh, as a coach, I think it could help. There, there's so many lessons I learned looking back on the things I did wrong, and part of it was lifestyle. You know, if I'm being honest with myself, I know I didn't do everything the right way. I might have done things the right way for the most part when it came to wrestling. But I was a guy that I, I was just okay with just doing enough so that I was eligible. The coaches weren't on my back. You know, I was okay with just, you know, a C, a B, whatever. And, and, and that was okay. I wasn't trying to dominate school. I wasn't trying to, like, be the best. I wasn't trying to win every class. And if I would have had that mindset, it probably would have made me a better wrestler. So, um, you know, so I, I'm able to kind of take those things that I learned by, by maybe not doing things the right way and, and help my guys understand that, Hey, I'm not telling you this because I did it the right way. I'm telling you this because I don't want you to feel what I felt. And it's been uh it's been something I think has been nice that where I've been able to kind of help these guys out. That nineteen ninety nine season, you guys edge Augsburg by a point and a half. Uh you fall in the finals to Justin Totten from the College of New Jersey. What is that experience like walking off the podium, you know, with one guy with his hand raised, the triumph at the peak of college wrestling? Uh, regardless of division, and, and what's it like being that other guy? Oh man, it was that was so tough. That was such a crazy year because we won the we won the title that year by a point and a half. And going into the finals, you know, I mean, it, I was definitely favored to win that match. And and so I, I lose the match, and and then uh, Ben Shane, who was right behind me, he was one forty nine that year. He wins a national title um, over a guy that had beaten him twice during the year. And so he, I mean, in essence, he wins the championship for us after I basically blew it. <laughs> and he, you know, and so I remember then Augsburg had a couple guys left to wrestle and both of those guys got beat. And, you know, I, I went from feeling miserable because I had lost to feeling, I mean, I was happy, but I was just so relieved that I was, you know, I put all this pressure on myself that it was going to be my fault if we didn't win the title. Um, you know, so it's, again, it's, it's lessons that I can, that I can, kind of take and, and help our guys with where I probably was too wrapped up in the team championship going into that match. I know I started getting ready for that match way too soon. I, I put, I made it a bigger deal than it was. It should have just been another match. So many lessons that I take from just that one match that I think uh, I can help my guys with that um, probably one of the worst times of my life that has turned out to be a real lesson for, for my guys. How soon was the turn to coaching for you? Because uh, Jim Miller is, uh, you know, at Wartburg and a lot of these Division three and these small college programs, they tend to keep athletes around as, as they finish up their, their uh, academics and as, as like a student assistant or a volunteer assistant. Uh, some, some of the places that do have graduate schools or grad assistants, but, uh, you know, you got a, got a lot of opportunity to, coaches, but, uh, to coach, but, uh, you know, what, what kept you around Wartburg and, and what really kind of turned you on to college coaching? Yeah, it was interesting. So I actually was um, a sixth grade teacher for my first three years out of college. I, I taught in Waverly. I taught at a private school there, and um, it, which I loved. I mean, I had a good time with it. Um, I have good memories from, from that time, and I was still um, a part-time assistant at Warburg at the time. And then, you know, somewhere along that line there, I decided that 
I love teaching, but I wanted to kind of focus on uh, coaching wrestling. I knew that was kind of what, where my passion was and what I wanted to follow. So I ended up um, deciding I applied for a job in the admissions office at Warburg, and I got hired as an admissions counselor. And so really what that did for me, one, is I knew that while I was going, while I was working in the office, Warburg had a deal where they would pay for you to like get your master's degree at the time or pay for like 85% of it. And, you know, for most small college positions, they want you to have your master's. And so that was part of my um, kind of motivation to take that job. And then also I knew it'd be good for recruiting um, and, and it was even better than I thought, you know, and so I was more tied into what was going on with the program because I was on campus every day. I was able to be really involved in the recruiting aspect of it. And then on top of that, I was recruiting just general students. And so I got really good at um, just the on-campus visit, you know, where I, when I first started, it was, it was pretty tough for me. And I, it's easy to, to talk to, to meet with a wrestler and, and kind of talk about, um, you know, things that we have in common, but it's pretty tough when you're talking about meeting with a, uh, you know, maybe a, a girl from small town Iowa who wants to major in major in music therapy. Okay, well, we don't have a lot in common, so it was it was just a, a good learning experience for me and, and a good way for me to kind of get out of my comfort zone. And so I uh, did that. I was in that office for five years, and so I was during that time that you know my three years teaching and then my five years there, I was an assistant at Warburg for eight years. And and during that time, there were a few positions that opened up, you know, where I could have probably gone on and been a full time assistant somewhere. But I was, I don't know if I was smart enough or just lucky enough, or, or maybe Coach Miller was good enough at, at convincing me to stick around. But I just figured, you know, if I was going to be um, part-time or if I was going to be an assistant, why not be at a place where I'm continuing to learn from one of the best coaches in the nation? And and so I was at Warburg, and I was like, you know, I, I learned so much from Coach Miller. I was on successful teams. Um, that was really the start of, and we were good when I was in college, but we were really good when, when I was coaching. Um, you know, we had an awesome coaching staff at the time. And so I, I just, it was uh, such a unique experience for me at the time to be around great coaches, to be part of a program that was dominating. And then um, in 2008, then this job at Grandview opened up. And, and so Coach Woodley, who was our football coach here, he got hired to be the first football coach in school history when we started football that year. And Coach Woodley and Coach Miller were um, college teammates, at, or well, at least college friends at, at UNI. They're both from, from the Waterloo area um, and, and knew each other. And Coach Woodley got a hold of, of Millboy and said, hey, you know, if you got a guy that'd be interested, let me know. And uh, that's kind of how I first heard about it and, and ended up getting the position. Yeah, and with with that position, uh, with that position, when Grandview announced they were uh, starting a wrestling program, it was kind of going with a trend. NAIA small schools were looking to add um, male enrollment because some of these smaller private liberal arts colleges, as as they may be across the country, and and some a lot of them one stoplight towns are looking to bring people on campus. And uh, you know what was that first phone call like with with the athletic director Troy Plummer? Yeah, I actually I shot him an email because I had heard that they were starting. They hadn't advertised for it yet or anything. And he got back to me pretty quick and just said, you know, yeah, um, nothing is you know, official, official, but it's going to be happening. So keep your eye out for the, uh, you know, when, when we officially announce it. And um, yeah, the first thing was just kind of a, a quick phone interview, mostly with HR, just to, you know, make sure I was a murderer or something. And then they invited me to come down and, and visit. And I ended up having two interviews. And um, realistically, like I, I probably what I, I know there was a lot of people who were probably more qualified than me for the job. Uh, um, but I think Plummer knew like part of it was, it was just the right fit for me and it was the right fit for Grandview at the time. Um, and he probably knew I would take it for less money than <laughs> some other people. So, uh, you know, but I came down and, and, you know, I'm from the Des Moines area originally. Um, I've had a lot of experience in, in private education, being at Wartburg and coaching there and working in the admissions office, obviously a huge part of why they were starting wrestling. Uh, I don't think their goal was to win national titles. It was just because they wanted to increase enrollment. And with my admissions background, I knew a lot about, you know, um, the, the enrollment side and admissions and retention and, you know, and, and keeping just recruiting the right type of kid. Um, you know, I, I'm, this is a Lutheran school. It's an ELCA Lutheran school. Uh, that's I'm ELCA Lutheran. I went to Warburg College, which is an ELCA Lutheran school. The private school that I was teaching at was the only ELCA Lutheran elementary school in the state. So, you know, is I think that God had a hand in it and, and just helped lead me to the right place. And, and for some reason, Troy took a chance on me and, and it's worked out pretty well. 
Yeah, when we look at the Grandview is is not the only program that was started in recent years uh, under Plummer that's that's seen success. They started a football program, have seen success. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, I think they actually beat Drake, which is right in town there, and I'm sure that went over really yep. well with the Des Moines with the Des Moines market. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't play again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great big turd burger to eat. But uh, in terms of <laughs> developing the program, we look at it in 2009, the first season, you have three All-Americans, but you have your first national champ in the first year, a guy named Matt Burns, which is probably one of the best wrestling yep. names of all time. I, a junior college kid right. you, you brought in from Iowa Central. And, you know, three All-Americans, three All-Americans, and then it explodes in 2011. But you you'd talked about trying to win quick or maybe who you were bringing in and you're looking around going, okay, we need to adjust things. Is, is that kind of the attitude that maybe a new coach with his first program feels like they need to do? Oh, I need to, I need to pull in these kids that are, that are backups and that way that that are good. And I can quickly put a a team together or, you know, how did, uh, how did that whole process work and saying, okay, who am I going to put on the mat those first two years? Yeah, it was, you know, I, I got hired in March, uh, which obviously is really late, you know, it was after the state wrestling tournament. And so that first year, uh, it was basically just, I was going out and trying to see who's out there, you know, and, and it was a real crazy mix where, I mean, Burns was the first, he was my first signee, which obviously you're doing pretty well when your first signee is a junior college national champ, but he was from the area too. He's from Urbandale. And so I, I totally got lucky on that. It wasn't my expert recruiting, you know, prowess or anything like that. It was just because, he was from the area and, and he wanted to be, he wanted to stay local. His family's down here. And so I got lucky with that one. And so I had burns, but then I was going out recruiting these high school kids. And again, it was just trying to see who was left, you know? And so it, it's, it's so different for every coach. You know, I know there's a lot of coaches out there that maybe they get a full year to recruit and, and I don't know maybe if that would have been better or not. I mean, yeah, it'd be kind of nice, but then again, um, that urgency of just building a team right away and getting going and letting these guys know, like, hey, we're going to compete right now and you got to be ready to go. And I think kids like that, you know, and I tell people who start new programs or somebody who's starting, um, you know, or coming in as a, as a new coach in a program where they're in a rebuilding phase. I actually kind of miss that part of the recruiting, being able to say, hey, you got an opportunity to come here and be the first All-American in school history. You have an, an opportunity to be the first national champion in school history yet, you know, who's going to be on the first team that wins the, the, the first championship. Like those things, people get excited about being a first, you know? And so for us now we're trying to dig in, what are the first that are left? But so it was that balance between building a team. Uh, I was in a hurry. I wanted to be good right away. I didn't, I wasn't going to make an excuse for myself or for our team for being young or for um, being a first year program that, to say like, Hey, this is um, it's okay for us to get beat just because we're young. Um, and at the same time, to be honest, I, I probably was too hard on those guys. I mean, I was, I trained them. I didn't train them much different than we were training the guys at Wartburg, and, which was a huge mistake because I had, you know, a handful of Juco transfers and then mostly freshmen. And so we started that year with like 26 guys. And I think we ended with 13 and maybe 12 of those guys came back. Um, you know, so I don't know. I don't know if it, it maybe if I would have been a little bit, um, a little bit nicer to some of those guys or didn't, you know, the expectations weren't quite as high or if I would have done a better job of giving them breaks at the right time, maybe we would have had more than 12 come back. But at the same time, you know, you're, you're, you're setting the bar for here's what it's going to look like here and you either have to get on board with it or else, you know, this isn't the right fit for you. And, um, you know, so that's kind of what, what we started with and that was the foundation and, and we just kept building on that each year. The past several years we've seen uh, the Grandview contingent travels well, but, how hard is it to build a wrestling culture where you have no wrestling alumni base? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the good thing is, you know, being in Iowa and being in the Midwest, people love wrestling. And so it didn't take too long for us to um, have fans that were, that were passionate about it. And, you know, we're the only college wrestling program in, in Des Moines. So here we are in the state capital of one of the best uh, wrestling states in the country. And there's no, there's no wrestling, college wrestling in this, in this city. And so, I think people around the area were excited to get on board and, and kind of get behind us. And, you know, part of it is you, you just have to go out and um, they, they, I think they feed off our passion. You know, they see what our coaching staff is like. They, they understand that how passionate we are about it. Obviously Iowans are really passionate about wrestling and if they're connected to somebody, whether it's their son or their cousin or their nephew, their passion, you know, they get out there and, and they get after it and they don't care really where you're from or, or what your team is. And so, you know, it was just a matter of continuing to bring in good kids. Um, and then, you know, there were parts of, the, the, most of those kids are part of a good family. And so the families get on board. 
And then we were lucky enough to, um, we just feel like we've done a pretty good job of building um, a, a booster base here of people that want to get behind the program. You know, our, our golf outing every year is full. We, we do, we have an after party after our national tournament, which is always like 200, 250 people. Our banquet is always huge. This year, we're going to have a 10 year reunion in May for having 10 years of, of wrestling, which I expect to be a, an awesome turnout. So we just, I think we do things on a, on a real high level here and people like that, you know, and, and it never seems rinky dink. You know, we, we have an after party at nationals at, after our national tournament every year at the hotel. And, you know, I know it's as good or, or better than most of the division one after parties at, at, at all schools, you know, and, and you don't see that a lot with small college wrestling. So I think it's something that, that we do that it really attracts people. Yeah, I've attended uh, a couple of those just uh, based on location and where I was staying. But one thing that I, the first one I walked into, uh, I'm trying to remember where it was, might have been down in Topeka was the first one I walked into. And I looked around and I'm like, this is very, very similar to a Wartburg post tournament after party. And uh, that seems to be sure. by design. What was it about uh, the way Coach Miller handled that type of championship uh, atmosphere that you felt was was a natural fit to bring to Grandview? Um, you know, obviously coach Miller's a legend and, and I, you know, there's, especially when I first started, there wasn't a day that went by that I would kind of think, all right, you know, what would, what would Millboy do in this situation? And, you know, that, and, and some of that stuff for a young coach too, because you're, um, you, you can't copy somebody, you know, you have to be genuine to yourself. And I think that that's like advice I give to all coaches is you can't, you can't try to be somebody else. You can't try to mimic someone else. You have to really be honest to, to who you are, you know, and you, such a great example of that is, I mean, in Iowa, people grew up watching Dan Gable coach. Obviously the guy is high intensity, you know, super intense, can't sit still in the corner, you know? And, and so he was kind of the legend and, you know, and, and maybe now somebody, you watch Kale Sanderson and it looks like he's ready to take a nap out there. Well, I can't sit in the corner like Kale does. And, and if you're laid back, you can't, you can't jump around like Dan Gable did. It's, it's just be, be who you are, you know, it's just be honest with who you are. And so, that was something that, that I learned right away that, that really helped me. Um, and, and I'm probably am a lot more like coach Miller and, and, and pretty intense in, in that aspect. But as far as the blueprint of, you know, things like the after party, um, you know, our golf outing and things like that, I just knew that it was always important to him. If we were going to do something, it was going to be, it was going to be good. It was going to be high level. It was going to be, it was going to be awesome. You know, you don't, you don't do something and do it halfway. If you're going to have a camp, you know, coach Reedy runs our camps. He's got some. He's got some awesome camps. I mean, he does a team camp unlike anybody else, and and it's and it's a great camp. When we put our our golf out in, you know, this year we were full. We had no room for anybody else. Like you don't have a golf out in with seven teams. So it's not worth the work. It's not. It, it looks JV, and we don't we don't do anything like that. You know, you're gonna do it. You're gonna do it right. So that's uh that's and that's why our after party is the way it is too. It's you know our banquet, same thing. When we do something, we're gonna make sure it's it's worth doing. Yeah, and this is not something, folks, if, uh, if if you've ever been to a Wartburg or a Granville, or actually, if you haven't, as we describe it, uh, this is not a pop-in, hey, hey, you're, you're milling around. There is speech after speech after speech. Every senior on that team is getting a chance to talk. Every All-American is getting a chance to talk, and it actually is pretty cool to see uh, when you're not in that environment. A couple things I do want to ask about uh, Jim Miller is, one... When did you, did the staff just sit there and be like, Jim, just get rid of the toupee, man. Just let it go. Embrace the bald. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I have no clue. <laughs> I, 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 no, no, and that's not, that's not me. Uh, I wasn't around then. I was gone. I was here. So I think all I know is one day he decided to, uh, to shave it and it looks good, man. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was all that stress of division three coaching against uh, the guys up in Minnesota that, that made him lose it. And secondly, um, I had TJ, his son, uh, who's now the head coach at Loris on the show, on the Division Three show here on the network not that long ago, and he talked about uh, getting a call, as as Paul Reedy had mentioned him as your assistant coach, he was apparently on his way to Louisiana to take a high school coaching mm-hmm. job, and you called him and said, hey, uh, I, I want you at Grandview. Explain, kind of fill in the gaps on that story on how, how Paul Reedy ended up going to Grandview, which in turn sent TJ Miller down to Louisiana, which in turn brought TJ Miller back to Iowa to coach at Loris. So it's, uh, it's all connected it's, in some manner. It's crazy. It, it, it is, man. It, it's so crazy how the world works. And, and again, man, I think that, you know, God leads us in a direction. And, and this was a prime example of that. Like I, uh, so yeah, that's exactly right. And I listened to that podcast. Reedy and I actually listened to it together. We were driving, we were cracking up listening to it, but we, uh, so that's what happened. I mean, we, I knew I was hopefully going to get a full-time assistant and I'd been talking with Plummer about it, my AD and, 
And finally, one day he's like, all right, we're going to do it. You know, and I've been talking to him about kind of some of my options or whatever. And, um, and I wanted it. I, I really did want Reedy. You know, I had, I had a couple other people I talked to, but it, it didn't seem like it was going to work out. And, and Reedy, um, I, I've known Paul for a long time. We actually lived together for a while in Waverly. He's a good friend of mine. And, and he was actually coaching at Perry High School as an assistant to Steve Hamilton. When those guys would have a snow day, he'd come in and work out with us. He'd come in the room. And, and it was just like watching him work with the guys. I was like, man, this guy, he's just so valuable to have around. And so I was telling Plummer, my AD, about it. And I was like, hey, he's, he's supposed to leave like tomorrow for Louisiana. We had a going away party for him, actually. Like, he gave him <laughs> gifts and everything. And uh, I was like, he's supposed to leave tomorrow for Louisiana. And I was telling him about him. And he's like, well, that's the guy. He's like, just go get him. And I was like, all right, you're right. I got to go. So I just went and, did, I went and called him. And I was like, Reedy, I got this job. Just found out. He's like, I, I, want, I was like, I want you to be the guy. And he was like, he said, he said, uh, I think he said the F word. And then he said, Mitch, I'm sick in my stomach. Because he, he just knew, like, he wanted to do it. But he just had made this commitment to Louisiana or whatever. And so he's like, just let me, let me call you back, right? And so whatever he calls me back, he's like, all right, I want to do it. I'm in. Um, but obviously there were some hoops we had to jump through. and. Uh, you know, I, I, to be honest, Coach Miller wasn't real excited about it because he helped him get the job down there. And, <laughs> and, you know, and so I was just like, hey, man, I mean, this is we're just looking out for what's best for our program and what's best for Reedy. And this is, you know, this is what we're going to do. And so he decided to do it. And, uh, and, and he's been with me ever since. This is his seventh year here now and uh, or eighth year, eighth year here now. He, he wasn't with us the first two years of the program. So this is the eighth year. And then, um, you know, that and yeah, TJ ends up going down there and getting that position. And it was great. I mean, it was good for TJ. He was a young guy and got some really good experience down there and then uh, ended up getting that uh, assistant job at Loris. Now he's that coach. So it was uh, it's crazy how it worked out, but it worked out the right way. I'm just picturing the scene from the, the, the teen romantic comedy where you're running through the gate going, no, <laughs> the, the, the stop and turn. And there's dr- dramatic embrace as as you right. see the plane take <laughs> off he gets on the plane. and Reedy's sitting there in the terminal going, I couldn't do it. You know, I'm just I'm just if, if this <laughs> yeah, were a made for TV movie, you guys have like Hallmark movie oh, written man. all over this. We're you doing know. it. Yeah. I like it. I Mitchell like and Reedy. <laughs> A Hallmark original Christmas movie. But uh, you know, it's, when, when building a championship lifestyle in the state of Iowa, you talked about how wrestling crazy it is. And I think anybody that uh, that knows anything about the sport of wrestling knows that uh, when you say the word wrestling, usually the word Iowa is, is, is followed shortly thereafter. But looking at the landscape of college wrestling, um, not counting the women's program up at Waldorf, there's 25 college wrestling programs in the state of Iowa. There's the three division ones, of course, Iowa, Iowa State, Northern Iowa. Upper Iowa's Division II, so another scholarship program. And then you've got six more NAIA scholarship programs to deal with. And you're contending with with Doug Schwab building a program at, at, at Northern Iowa. You've got your alma mater, Wartburg, that's successful. I mean, you've got a lot of competition and even a lot of scholarship competition to draw kids into Grandview. How have you been successful with the kids coming out of high school? Yeah, the state of Iowa, as far as recruiting goes, is crazy, you know, and obviously the the number of high school wrestlers in in Iowa isn't anything compared to, you know, some of the other states, even surrounding us and and the states out east. So we are really all fighting for the same kids. Um, But it's really about building a niche here, you know, and so part of it is for us is, um, you know, just helping guys understand like what our vision is when they come, when they come visit, Um, you know, and, and so it's, there's that combination of, of course, you're recruiting, trying to recruit the best kids, and they're looking at your program or Division One program. You have to help them understand why you can still be your best at a small school. You can come to a school like Grandview. Um, yeah, you don't get to write D1 athlete on your Twitter profile, but other than that, um, everything could be a great experience. So um, that, that's, a, that's a big part of it. Um, you know, we, we've got a niche here. Most of the small schools in Iowa are in small towns, and we're right here in Des Moines. And so – Obviously, most of these guys, they want to go out and get jobs after they graduate. And there's no better place in Iowa to do that than Des Moines. I mean, this is Des Moines is the destination place in Iowa. So when you're looking at internships and field experiences, Grandview is the spot to be. I mean, there, there's no better place in Iowa than Des Moines. So we got that. And then, of course, you know, people want to win. And every program, I don't care where you go visit, they're going to talk about their plan for winning the title. You know, we want to win this. We want to win this. But after so long, history doesn't lie. You're either winning or you're not. And if you're not, there's a reason, you know, and, and I know that um, maybe some people don't like hearing that, but it's, it's just the facts. You know, you can only go so long and not win. And, and you have to be honest about, okay, there's a reason you're not winning. And so 
when we when people visit here, we don't talk about what we're going to do. We we don't talk about uh, what we've done in the past either. And people already know, you know, we, we don't sit around and talk about our stats and, and all this or, or make any promises for the future. We talk about that lifestyle. We talk about what the day in, day out life is going to be like if you come here. And, and, and you have to buy into that championship lifestyle and you have to understand wh- what um, components go into that, how you, how you live that out on a daily basis. And if guys like that, they love it at Grandview. And if they don't like that, they shouldn't come here anyway. And so I'm just real clear about that when they come visit. And, and most guys, that's what they want. People want to find out how good they can be. They, they, they want to live that kind of life. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, you talk about like setting the bar high. That's, that's kind of a cliche, but this is like, it, it's removing the bar. It's, it's finding out how good, like there, there's no limit to it. And so um, people start getting excited about that because they want to know, they want to know how good they can be. And this is a place you can do it. So that's the, I think that's the differentiator here. Yeah, you don't throw out the stats. I'll throw out the stats since, uh, what, 2013 was your last dual meet loss. You've won 93 out of your 94 uh, in the last duel, 64 in a row. And of that, uh, you know, there's seven NAI National Duels Championships in there. That last duel loss was to Iowa State, and uh, that was that was moments after you beat a Division One school in Drexel. And, of course, everybody keeps circling that date because if, if – and I'm not going to beat Brandon right up too much over this, but if he makes weight at 133 <laughs> – Chances are, it's a good chance Grandview beats Iowa State in that duel meet. What do you remember about that event? I remember Brandon Wright being four tenths over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, and I love Brandon, and he's doing big things. He's he's uh, he's competing internationally right now, and um, no, that's just really the thing was for us. We were, um, I mean, looking back on it, I guess the the thing that I wanted to make sure our guys understood, and, and it's happened a lot since then, is people are. We're trying to pat us on the back for wrestling Iowa State close in that that year, and that wasn't the goal for us. And it's never the goal. It's, and and I'm not talking about the winning and losing part. The the goal is to go out and compete at a high level at every weight class. You know, maximum effort. Go out and out fight somebody at every weight every weight class. And in that duel, that, that didn't happen at every weight class. And and that's the real reason we didn't win the duel. It wasn't because somebody didn't make weight. You know, it's you, you got to have that consistent fight throughout the lineup. So. Um, that, that was really what it came down to. And, and so, yeah, people, it's just like anything else. The first three years of the program were eighth, ninth and fifth in the nation. And we have national champ every year and people want to pat us on the back for that. Well, that, that, that wasn't okay for us. That wasn't what we wanted. And same thing then, you know, people try to pat you on the back for wrestling a division one team close. Well, but we, we didn't come here to wrestle close, you know? So still to this day, man, I'm not, you know, it's the last, last time we got beat and I don't like losing. So still don't really like it too much. We look in college football that we, we say that why would anybody at the division one level schedule North Dakota state? I guess you can kind yeah. of say the same thing now. Um, why would anybody outside of the, you know, out, you know, why would anybody want to schedule Grandview if you're not an NAIA program? I mean, how have you gone after some of those, uh, you know, D2, D3 schools that, uh, you know, have some success? I mean, you know, people want to see the Wartburg Grandview duel. Why? Why hasn't things like that happened? Yeah, we've you know over the years we've reached out to a few schools, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and 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 it's never like uh, you know it's never like a somebody. I don't feel like for the most part, and at least the D twos, the D threes, like those people aren't aren't dodging here or anything like that. And we wrestled Maryville a few years ago um, over in Council Bluffs. Um, you know, so we've been able to do that a lot. A lot of times with scheduling and. As far as the Warbrick thing goes, people ask us a lot, and I don't know. It's probably getting to a point where, yeah, maybe we should get it done. And you know, in the past, I think that maybe when we first started the program and they've been established for a long time, maybe it was more of a no-win situation for them, kind of like it would be if we wrestle a Division One team. Um, and, but I think that's different now. I mean, we've we've been established, we've been around for a long time. So, it, you know, again, it's about scheduling. Those guys have a bunch of duels and. They uh they wanted to do it, we'd probably do it. But uh it's it's really with anybody and we, we just want to duel. We we want to wrestle the best competition at, at every level and that's why we try to schedule our, our schedule the way we do. I mean, we try to go out and have the best best competition, the best tournaments. Um pretty dis- disappointing this year we didn't we weren't able to wrestle at the Midlands. They didn't let any non division one teams in. And um it's frustrating, man. It's not it's just not uh it's not what we're about. You know, we want to go out and it's not about again winning and losing; it's competing against the best, and, and so that's why we do a lot in the off season. That our guys compete um, freestyle and, and Greco in the off season because we just want to keep competing. We want to wrestle the best guys, and, and we just have to be creative about finding ways on how to do that. 
talked about Brandon Wright wrestling on the senior level as he's now an assistant at Indiana. But uh, Evan Hansen got won a national title for you. He qualified for the World Team Trials last year, and people are look, looking around the mats going, "Who the heck is this guy?" So uh, you know the, yeah. the opportunity to to compete over there. I know Mark Bauer at Nebraska Kearney when he was the head coach there. Uh, kind of his recruiting pitches, he can give you everything except a Division One national championship. Uh, how true is that for a coach trying to get a guy that that may be the diamond in the rough, that that may be eventually a Tervel Delagnev? I mean, how do you try to sell that dream that maybe this kid thinks they can be Division One, or they haven't even grown into a Division One athlete yet? Yeah, no, I, I think that's it. You know, just that idea. Of, a lot of it comes back to fit. You know, where are you going to be happy? I mean, Evan, he's from a real small town. Um, you know, I, I just. A big, a big school would not be the right fit for him, you know. And uh, he came to Grandview, and he's really thrived here. And 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 it's evidence for anybody that's looking at a, at a school like Grandview that you can do things on a big scale. Evan's done it, you know. He, he's won he won a national title last year as a redshirt freshman. Uh, he's ranked first in the nation right now, but he's wrestled at the UW Junior Nationals. He's wrestled at the UWW Junior World Team Trials twice. And we had um, Lawton Bennett who wrestled at the Junior World Team Trials. Uh, two years ago, I mean, we just we we do all the same things that the, the big scale the, the big schools do, um, but yeah, we're just not going to wrestle at the Division One national tournament. And and I think people, I mean, it's so hard because high school wrestlers they go to the national tournament, the, the Division One national tournament, and it's an awesome atmosphere, you know, and, and it is great. But that's the one that you know the three days of the year that it's like that. The other, the rest of the year we're all at the same crappy gym with 50 people in the stands that we're all at the same, you know, it's the same every, every weekend, week out, it's the, the weekends are the same. It's not the, it's not that every, every weekend. And so people have to understand that's not your daily life. And the other part of it is when we talk about daily life is where, where are you going to be at a place where uh, you know, the coaching staff is going to take care of you. They're going to they care about your future. It's not just about wrestling, you know, a place that is really going to help you, um, be a better person for the rest of your life. And, and that's really what this whole championship lifestyle thing is about is, of course, we want it. We, we want to live this because it's going to make them better wrestlers. But th- there's something that's way more important than that. And it's the type of people these guys become, because we all know guys who are, are great wrestlers that are national champions, world champions, Olymp- Olympic champions, who really aren't very good people. And and what good is that? You know, it's it's no good. No nobody is that impressed about your medal after a while. You know, they want to know how you, how are you going to treat them? How how what type of person are you? And and that's the bigger part of this. And so yeah, of course we we hope it helps you win titles. But more importantly, what kind of dad are you going to be down the road? You know, what what kind of husband are you going to be? And if you leave Grandview, you, you better keep living that. You know, the rest of your life. And we, and we want you to be great at everything. It's not just about the medal that you get. When you look at the type of kid that comes to the program, uh, of course, with winning comes critics and critiques, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it's you've had your share of second and in some cases, third chance transfers that have come in. You've had a lot of guys that uh, not necessarily de- most of your transfers seem to have been at the junior college level because uh, the Division One ad schools are, are taking less risks on junior college because of the APR. But, uh, you know, for, for every guy like, you know, Andrew Long is, is one I think most people point to. Uh, but you have a, a success story in Eric Thompson turning his life around. And what are some other other rationales that you have for taking in a kid that might have been run out of another program, or or he was a he was a bad you know a bad seed in in terms of uh, where he was with that that case? And they come to Grandview, they win, and it's looked at negatively. Oh well, he was thrown out of here, and you mm-hmm. you picked him up, and now he's an All American. I mean, how much of that is is life coaching, and how much of it is is just sour grapes? Yeah, I, I think. Um... People probably don't, and I understand it's because we're successful that people want to you want to nitpick those things. And um, you know, with any situation where there's Andrew or you know other other guys that have come here where they got if they were in trouble before or um, they left a program, you know, and it, things weren't going well, um, they have to understand. Like number one, of course, we do our our background research on these guys. Of course, we we talk to coaches, we talk to the kid a lot. Um, the number one thing I look for when I talk to the kid is, you know, his response to it, does he try to blame the coaches or does he is the first thing that he says is, yeah, I screwed up. Like it's my fault because that that's step one. And if these guys can admit that, then we know like they legitimately are, are, are looking to make some changes, but if they can't do that, if they blame the coaches, they blame parents, they blame the programs, then they're not going to be any different when they get there. So um, that's a big part of it. And honestly, like 
I, I really do have a soft spot for, for the, some of these kids because I know they're young and they're stupid sometimes, you know, so it's not, um, I just, I, I want to help these guys. And, and the thing the other people that, that a lot of people don't know is you hear about the, the ones that are successful. We've taken some guys here that never wrestled a, a varsity match for us. And we've taken some guys in that maybe had a history that they were just a guy on the team that nobody would know their name. Nobody knew um, their wrestling credentials. And, and so people think we're just doing it just because they're good wrestlers. That's not the case. And, and we've had some really good success stories of some guys like that too. And, and I'm just as proud of those guys, man. I, I love those guys for the changes they've made. Um, so I do, I, I mean, I have kind of a soft spot for some kids like that, you know, because I, I really think like I can, I can make a difference in these guys' lives. Um, not just while they're in school, but the rest of their lives, the type of people they're going to be, and, uh, and and maybe beyond, you know, when it's just it, that that's really important to me. And, and as the older I get and the more time I spend coaching, uh, that's that's where I put the value on this thing. And, um, of course, I'm competitive and I want to win, and, and I hope that keeps happening. But, again, I, I can't preach one thing and live something else. And so people on the outside of our program that maybe aren't as connected, they, they might think it looks one way or they, they might assume things are happening one way. But uh, really it, the focus is um, what kind of people are these guys going to be the rest of their lives? And, and I hope I can make a, a big impact for these guys forever. Yeah, it definitely seemed like Eric Thompson was, was kind of a, a guy that this, the program can circle, look at me like, look, this guy was obviously in a bad place at Iowa state. He, he, you know, who knew he was, was ever going to wrestle again. He was you know, number one coming out of high school. And then, he gets a second chance. He's a three-time national champion, Midlands place winner. Uh, you know, w- went on to wrestle in some world team trials. I mean, now he's at it, at, at Penn State coaching with the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club there. And then you've got uh, what could have been a success story with Andrew Long, and then uh, you know, basically he he got shown the door after uh, breaking some of the uh, the stipulations of his uh, I guess quote unquote contract there at Grandview. And uh, you know, that was a year you guys set the team scoring record without, or you first set it, you first broke it without him even. In the tournament, how hard was that yeah. for, uh, for for you to deal with, knowing that, okay, just you know, a month and a half earlier, Andrew was on the Big Ten Network showing, showcasing Grandview University, and then uh, you know, his, his, his path had been checkered. People knew about it, and uh, you know, people were saying, okay, how, when is he going to screw up again? I mean, how, how hard was that for you as a coach? And you know, uh, you know, the highest of highs with the Midlands title, the lowest of lows was saying, I'm sorry, you got to go. Yeah, it was tough, man, and I and I I love Andrew, I still do, and and so I think again, you know, people on the outside can look at it and they can be like, ah, he's such an idiot, and they, you know, people want to call him names and 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 maybe give us a hard time for giving him a chance, and I understand that, you know, I, I really do, but um, I, I got to know Andrew, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to him and spending time with him before before he came to Grandview, and we really felt confident about where he was, and you know that. That that all that time that he was with us and, until he slipped up, things were great. I mean, he had a 4.0 first semester. He was really like having another coach on the team. I mean, everything was going so well. Like you said, he won the Midlands Championship. He's the outstanding wrestler of the tournament. Like things were so were, were so good. Um, but it's to me, it's a, it's a prime example and maybe a little bit of a lesson for me to understand too that there's some things that as a coach we're not qualified to deal with. You know, and and when it comes to um, serious addiction problems when it comes to some mental health issues. You know, I, I can, I can help motivate a kid. I can help, um, get a kid, you know, kick his butt and make him go to class and talk to him about his lifestyle. But when you're talking about, um, chemical issues with addiction, chemical issues with, uh, mental health problems, I, I don't have that in my toolbox, you know? And, and so maybe that was kind of the, the wake up call for me is that we gotta, we gotta do a better job understanding what we can and can't take on. Um, but, Again, like I said, that that's the that's the one that you know people know about that didn't work out. But uh, you know, we've had so many positive experiences uh, with some other guys that um, you know. And, and I guess kind of going back to your question, going through that season when that all happened, when when we decided we had to let him go, um, I just told the guys like, hey, uh, Andrew's really good, and uh, you know it, it's it's tough that it had to happen like this. You know, the week before the national tournament, but he's not going to wrestle your matches. <laughs> you know, he's. He was good, but he wasn't that good. So he wasn't going to wrestle every weight class. So just go out and focus on what you have to do. And, and it just doesn't really have any impact on you guys, you know. And we tried to just make sure that the um, the, the coaching staff, Coach Reedy and I, we, we absorbed the, the stress of that. We tried to make sure that the guys were guarded from it. And for the most part, they didn't even know what was going on. I mean, it all happened pretty quick. 
and uh, we just try to make sure those guys uh, were, were focused on what they had to do. You look at it, and that was actually between the regional and the and the national championship. It wasn't like okay, it's like a regional and go. Yeah. But then then there's the record, right. and then last year, 2017. This is, I mean, on paper, I'm, I follow the NAI fairly closely, and I'm looking, going, okay, yeah, this is a good squad. They're they're probably going to be favored to win it big time. I didn't see 234 and a half. And the year before, I don't know yeah. if I saw 210. It's, I mean, these are the point totals that are, I mean, you, 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 you tie a record in 14, and that was in an era that Dana College had set the record in 2006 with, as, as other, as Caleb Schaefer at, at Providence will joke, uh, the bonus round where you had all sorts of qualifiers right. <laughs> that probably had no business being at the tournament. And it's like, okay, the top five teams are going to get, you know, 12, 12 falls and you're going to start out with 24 points after round one. Now it's right. 240 that are in there. It's a lot more compact of a tournament. It's an exciting tournament, which again are hosted in, in Des Moines coming up March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd that weekend. But last year's team, I mean, can, can, can you kind of wrap your head around 234 and a half points at nationals and what was a pretty good field depth wise? Yeah, it really was. I mean, if you look at the, the parody um, from second place, really all the way down to like, 11th 12th place. i mean if you go from second all the way down to like 12 13 like every team going step down is within like three four points of each other so it was pretty crazy um and, and no i mean you never as a coach you're always nervous like I, i've never walked into a tournament like oh man we're just gonna blow through this thing um it's just not how i think and so i had no idea that that last year um could be a year like that you know and i, I knew we at our at our conference tournament our regional qualifier there we actually didn't lose a match um, last year, uh, other than the the couple times we had to wrestle each other um, or had to wrestle teammates. And so we, we really got a good thing going there um, the, the two weeks before last year. But again, like it was just it was just um, it was obviously it was a lot of fun, you know. And and that's the part of it. You know, we just tell these guys like go in and and this is a celebration, man. Have a good time here. And uh, that's kind of how they approached it. And it was just like one after another. These guys kept kept beating guys. Vast other coaches in the NAI, what it's like. Uh, matter of fact, Caleb Schaefer, for example, has had to coach uh, or, or has had two of his kids meet in the finals, but he was also one of those guys that had to wrestle a teammate in the finals. What's that like for you coming from Division Three, where, uh, you know, you got one guy per weight class, and now in the NAI you can have uh, two teammates meet in the finals. I mean, what do you as a staff do in that situation? Just back off and let them go, or you just kind of sit in the corner and be quiet? Yeah, so in the you know if it's during the season or at, you know even at a conference tournament last weekend we had uh, at twenty five and seventy four guys had to wrestle in the semis. Um, we just kind of back off and let them wrestle. We we, we just watch from afar. Um, in uh, I think it was two thousand fourteen was when Gustavo Wright, Gustavo Martinez and Brandon Wright wrestled in the the national finals. That was the only time we've had two finalists at the same weight. Um, those guys actually came up with the idea of each having a couple assistants in their corner because they wrestled at the, the regional finals that year. And they said it was kind of awkward. It's like all quiet, you know? So they said, Hey, if, you know, let's just pick a couple assistants and it worked out nice because everybody was on the same page. Like, Hey, we're not picking favorites or anything. These guys are just each going to pick a couple guys to be in the corner. Um, but the thing that I didn't expect that that was really different is, you know, all the years when we've had finalists at, at the national tournament, I'm excited about it. Of course, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm like, you know, I'm like, hey, hey we're going we're gonna to win this match. You know, I feel, I feel good about it. I feel confident. We have a game plan going in. That match was probably the worst I felt nerves-wise going into it because I knew somebody was going to lose. And I had never even considered that because we'd always joke around about it. Like, yeah, me and Reedy, we're going to be up in the stands, like eating popcorn and hanging out. It wasn't like that. I was like, I was nervous the whole time. You know, I just, I, I hated the fact that one of our guys was going to have to lose that match. But but I love that system, you know, and that year, Gustavo and Brandon were at the same weight. Um, that was a really tough weight that year. And those guys dominated their ways, their way to the finals. And I really think it's because they had each other in the room. I mean, they did it the right way. They trained together a lot. They pushed each other, you know, and then probably a week, week and a half before the regional tournament, they, they kind of stopped working out as much and they went their separate ways. But I was, um, I was, I used those guys as a model of how that should be done within the room because, I think sometimes you hear about teammates that are at the same weight trying to avoid each other. And, and to me, that's ridiculous. I mean, that, that's one of your, your best training opportunities right there. You know, that, that's what it's supposed to be about. So that's, those guys did it right that year, and it, was, it, it showed at the tournament. How much of that multiple entries of weight class really kind of helps you with recruiting? 
I think it does help. You know, I, I think it's something – we don't talk a ton about it, but I think the, the thing that people understand, the parents like it because it doesn't. It means when you come in here, we're never going to ask you to cut a ton of weight just to try to make the lineup. You know, that, that's one thing where that year that uh, Gustavo and Brandon wrestled, that was the year that Brandon missed weight at the Iowa State tournament. He was trying to get to 133. Well, Gustavo was the returning national champion. So if, if that would have been a season like that, you know, where we only could take one guy, he was probably going to have to make that cut. He was just going to have to do it. But we got to a point where he was like, you know, that I, I'm just, I can't make it. And 41 is a better weight for me. And so instead of having to have a wrestle off, you know, you still get to use those guys. And, and I think the other part is when you look at it, a team like ours, where we've had consistent success, you know, a lot of guys come into college and part of their decision-making process is, can I make the lineup? Well, here it shouldn't matter who else is there. If it, you know, if you're if you're a young guy and, and you want to wrestle 197 and you see Evan Hansen is in the lineup, you shouldn't be like, well, he's only a sophomore this year. I can't make the lineup for two years. I'm not going to come. That's not how it works here. You just come and, and be one of the guys. It, you and Evan should wrestle the national finals. So that that excuse shouldn't matter here if, if you're if you're mentally tough enough situation at dual meets and even even at the national duels you were bumping guys up and down a weight which doesn't happen a whole lot in division one division two but uh, you have a little bit of flexibility that based on some of the uh, the gap in competition but one thing about it is i'm curious with the depth that you have in your room the nai allows you to enter 12 at the regional and then if all 12 qualify yeah. for nationals you're scoring but how hard is it for you as a coach to say all right these are going to be the 12 because you've, you've got yeah. you're probably two three deep at every weight it is tough, you know, and that's part of the, you know, what's really tough about that is what, you know, sometimes you're making a decision on, you can leave a guy, you can leave a weight at home and take two guys at a different weight. So like last year, we didn't take 125 or 157, but we took two guys at four weights. Um, and so that was, that's tougher because when a kid is, maybe he's been the guy at the weight class, um, then you got to let him know, like, hey, you know, this, we're, we're going to go this route instead. And that's always, for me, it's the toughest part of the year. And we don't make those decisions until really late, but for the most part, you know, um, I think guys usually have a pretty good idea of, of you know, where they stand. And, um, and I know that there's some extra pressure on some guys, but, uh, I think that's okay. I mean, the, the pressure of that should be okay because there's pressure wrestling at the national tournament, you know? And so how, how are you going to respond in those pressure situations is, is really key, but I hate it. I hate telling those guys that, um, you know, Hey, you're not going to be one of the guys. And, uh, most years, there's somebody that's really mad at me, but they usually get over it. And, uh, you know, I've had some that, you know, maybe didn't talk to me for a month or something, but then we get back together. And, and I don't have anybody that's still bitter about it, you know, years later, anything like that. So I think guys are, they're, they've been part of our program. They understand the accountability aspect of that, and they know what it takes to be one of those guys. There's some uniqueness to the NAI beyond just the the 12 that you get to enter in the postseason. There's the champions of character. There's a lot of, you know, as you said, uh, Grandview, they're a faith-based institution. Uh, also, different rules with uh, in terms of when you can sign kids. What are some of the things that you had to learn uh, kind of on the job of, of the differences between the NAIA and the NCAA that, that many of the fans that just follow uh, maybe just Division I uh, may be unaware of? You know, the big thing for me was, um, you know, I coached Division Three for a long time, and um, in the state of Iowa, you know, at that time, NAIA wrestling probably didn't have a great reputation. Um, in, in general, I, when I first started, there was only like 37 or 38 NAIA teams total. Now there's like 60, 61. So we've grown faster than any other division right now. Um, you know, so some of that was um, probably made me a little bit hesitant. But again, you know, I use Coach Miller as, a, as kind of a, a guide on this. I know when he started at Wartburg, Division three wrestling didn't have a, a great reputation in the state of Iowa either. I mean, don't get me wrong. They, they were like, people knew the schools and, and they were good schools and, and people liked it, but they weren't known for winning national titles. They weren't known for being powerhouses. And that was kind of the same thing in, in Iowa. And so hopefully we've been able to help kind of change people's perception of NAI wrestling and, and see that it, you know, it, it's just as good, if not better than a lot of the other small, small divisions. Um, so there's that. And then the other part was, you know, I felt like we, when I first started, there was like this um, stigma that there like there weren't any rules in the NAI. What I found out quick was there's way more um, rules as far as eligibility and things like that than there was when I was coaching Division Three. I mean, you know, ours is is really similar to like the Division Two and Division One, where you know we have to um, guys have to have a certain GPA, 
you have to have passed a certain amount of credits. I mean, there's some things that uh, weren't the case, you know, in, in, at the Division three level. And so that was a big difference for me. And, and now we have, you know, for the past, I think, six, seven years, we've had the eligibility center, which is our version of the clearinghouse. And so it's it's tough. I mean, you, there's a lot of lot of um, a lot of rules that just like at the NCAA Division One level that you, you're just always something you find out every year that man we got to be on top of this. We have to be on top of this because if not, then you could lose the eligibility pretty easily. Yeah, although you could still probably be what fifty and wrestle in the NAIA, right? Because <laughs> you got the yep. the stop yep. and start with the clock, right? Right. Same as Division Three, though. It's the same thing. Division Three. All right, Nick, as we wrap up here, this episode of the World Wrestling Resource Podcast, the NAIA Championships are back in Des Moines, uh, Jacobson Exhibition Center, right there at the Iowa State Fairgrounds, March 2nd and 3rd. Uh, Catch Des Moines done a good job of promoting this thing, and, and it's in the backyard again, uh, in a fun place to watch wrestling. As your fan base and alumni base grows, uh, it's pretty safe to say that you guys are, are the pronounced favorite, but uh, how does that, uh, a, how do you approach preparation for, for a national championship that's uh, it's not in Topeka the, where it's been the last three years. They've been a great host, but it's uh, it's in your backyard. Maybe a little added pressure, but uh, you, you're you're the top dog and you're the team that everybody loves to see lose now. Yeah, yeah, they are. We are the set team, and I know that um, a lot of people are. You know, I watch the Super Bowl, and I hear a lot of people uh, don't want uh, Tom Brady and the Patriots to win. And there's a lot of people happy that they didn't. So uh, whatever, I guess that's that's a good thing. You're in that after a while, but we just we approach it the same way. You know, it's. These guys have been wrestling all season long. There's no reason to change anything up now. They they know what's going to make them feel good before they compete. Um, we're going to stay in a hotel like we always do, so it's going to be you know that, that same level and, and getting out of their dorm rooms and their off campus houses. And we're just going to go and and uh, compete at, at the highest level possible and have fun with it. And we'll uh, see how it turns out. Hopefully, hopefully we win the thing again. But even if we whether we win or not, we we just we want to we want to perform to our highest level. So. It's not going to be just about winning. We we want to we want to find out how good these guys can be here in a couple of weeks. Subscribe to the World Wrestling Resource Podcast by going to wwrpodcast dot com and check it out on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spreaker, or wherever you find your podcasts. World Wrestling Resource at worldwrestlingresource dot com. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.